Hello, everyone. Welcome to this free webinar presented by WePast. I'm your moderator, Christina Ruiz. During this webinar, feel free to use the chat to ask your questions and discuss the topic. We will take time after the presentation during the Q&A to answer these. Throughout the webinar, we will stop the presentation to review. Look for the multiple choice review questions, which you will be able to answer in the polls section. Please go ahead and respond to these questions as they come up. You will have less than a minute to answer each one. This and other recorded webinars are available to WePass subscribers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Be sure to register through WePass.com to become a subscriber. If you're already a WePass subscriber, the slides for today's presentation are currently posted in the Therapeutic Medical Physics section under the Lectures tab. Today, today's topic is titled AAPM TG292 Electronic Brachytherapy Dosimetry, presented by Dr. Wesley Culverson, Associate Professor in the Department of Medical Physics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Director of the University of Wisconsin Accredited Dosimetry Calibration Laboratory. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Culverson. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you all for joining today for this webinar, educational webinar. I'm uh, real excited about telling you about a task group you've probably never heard about, TG292. And since this is a very niche task group on a very niche type of brachytherapy dosimetry, we're going to spend some time today talking about a little more generic brachytherapy dosimetry uh, leading into the introduction of electronic brachytherapy dosimetry. I understand a lot of people that will be watching this are people that are preparing for board exams. And so I want to touch on a few topics that would be important. Someone, some questions you may get in uh, part two or part three of the ABR exams. But also, I do want to tell you about this task group so you're familiar with it. And also about some of the nuances with electronic brachytherapy dosimetry. So let's go ahead and get started. We do have four polling questions today. And I've got them uh, interspersed throughout this presentation. Okay, let me progress the screen here. I'm pressing spacebar, Christina. I am pressing my mouse. Oh, you'll want to go to the slides and then if you press next. Okay, if I go to slides and press next. Let's see, ah, here we go. All right, sorry everybody. I have no disclosures to, uh, to disclose today. So I'm gonna start with just two slides on the background and the rationale behind this task group. And then I'm gonna go into the dosimetry a little bit. So I'm gonna use the acronym EBT, stands for electronic brachytherapy. And I just, in the last uh, 10, actually last 20 years, there's been several brachytherapy manufacturers that have chosen to, to do this path of electronic brachytherapy. That is a source that can be turned on and off. There's manufacturers in the United States and there's several in Europe and around the rest of the world. Right now, there's only, I believe, three of these that are FDA approved in the United States, but there's many more around the world. I, I say many more, there's probably about 10 total. We're really only gonna be touching on a few of them today. They're all a little different. And in, in addition to that, each manufacturer has its own way of having applicators. These are devices that go on top of the sources. They each have their own calibration tools, procedures, different types of quality assurance systems and tests you need to do. So we're going to touch on, like I said, a few things today, but by no means we're going to be able to hit everything. There's a lot of different traceability of primary standards. And what do I mean by that? A primary standard is, is a way to determine something like air kerma strength or air kerma or dose to water at a primary level. That's a primary lab. The National Standards Lab in the United States is called NIST. There's, there's one in Germany called PTB. There's one in the United Kingdom called NPL. And all of the calibrations that happen in the lab that I'm involved in in Wisconsin, the ADCL, are traceable to a primary standard. We'll go into a little bit more detail on that. And the background, uh, uh, no formal recommendations from the AAPM exist for EBT. There are three task groups in the works right now, and there's very few details, but the, the, all three task groups are not published yet. The, the other two are a little bit ahead of uh, TG292, which I'm involved in but none of them are published. There's few details on how to do dosimetry measurements um, in the literature. There's no sources on the brachytherapy source registry. The source registry is maintained by, 
I rock Houston. This is something that if you're starting a brachytherapy program and you want to make sure a source has been blessed by the WAPM, then you go to the brachytherapy source registry. It's online and you can find your source, find all the dosimetry parameters there. Right now, there's no EBT sources on this registry. They're working their way on there, but they're not there yet. And like I said, there's no other task groups specifically for EBT dosimetry. Now, TG, there's a task group called TG253. That one is for the applications of electronic brachytherapy for surface applications. That's for skin treatments. But the TG292 that we're going to talk about today is just for putting the source inside of a patient, intracavitary, interstitial type treatments. Okay, so back to the basics here. Brachytherapy typically involves a radionuclide. And I'm going to just start talking a little bit about radium-192. That's the most popular high-dose rate brachytherapy radionuclide. You can see an example of a source on the left. It's basically an iridium capsule in, uh, attached to a metal wire by a weld. And that is very high activity and has to be controlled remotely by an afterloader called a remote afterloader. The energy spectrum of an iridium source I've shown here with an intensity plot, and that's a logarithmic scale. So you see a lot of lines here. The most prominent lines are around uh, between three and 400 keV. And, but there's a lot of different energy lines, right? It's not a single energy that um, some people refer to it as a single energy. So with a bunch of these discrete gamma ray energy lines, there's not one energy that is really perfect, a descriptor. So oftentimes in the dosimetry world, we, we talk about a weighted average. And for iridium, this is approximately 397 keV. That's considered the weighted average. And you don't weight it just by the number of counts on that spectrum I just showed you. You weight it by absorption coefficients, things like mu n over rho, and, and that helps the weighting be more appropriate for how these energies, how these gamma rays are going to interact in tissue. Okay, iridium dosimetry. In a clinic, if you have a HDR program for iridium-192, a calibrated well chamber is used. And what we're going to talk about today is a lot of you may know how to make a measurement on a well chamber. You put a source in, you take a reading, and you use a calibration. But where does that calibration come from? It, it's it's more than just a number. Now we're going to talk about that today. The source strength measurement, so the calibration on your chamber is for air karma strength, and that's denoted S sub K. So that's the, you don't use curies, you don't use activity, it's called air karma strength. And how was air karma strength originally measured for a source like this, it's measured with a small chamber in air. That's not something you would do in a clinic. You use a well chamber. But that little small chamber in air doesn't actually happen at NIST. This is a very unusual area of radiation dosimetry and that NIST doesn't have that standard. So that standard is actually one of them that's maintained at the calibration labs. And this is how we do that in Wisconsin. It's something called the seven distance measurement. This is a, a rather large device. Uh, made out of acrylic, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go into uh, whiteboard mode here. I'm gonna circle where in this in this picture the source sits. Okay, so the source sits right here where I just draw in this red circle there, and it has to be suspended in air. It's very tricky to suspend it, and then there's an ionization chamber over here. You can see a very small chamber. It's called an X rad A3 chamber. It's suspended in air, and we move the chamber to seven different distances away from the source. And why is it seven? Well, it's, it just happens to be that's enough distances to adequately get the results you need. The unit of air karma strength, the quantity of air karma strength is air karma at a meter. And it's just too hard to get a big enough chamber aligned at a meter because that little source is kind of dangling in air and it kind of it kind of moves around a little bit. So we use this technique where we solve for multiple unknowns involving scatter in the room, and air attenuation, and then the last thing is the offset of the source. And so once you do that, your traceability to NIST, like I said, NIST doesn't have this standard, your traceability is through the calibration of this little chamber, N sub K. So you can see there's an N sub K that we use for an X-ray beam, and an N sub K that we use for a cesium-137 source. So that X-ray beam would be 250 kV, KVP, and the cesium-137 is about 662. So iridium, at, which is 400 KV, falls right in the middle of those two. You interpolate those, you get a calibration, you do this fancy measurement, and now you'll know the error karma strength of this particular source, and then you can dunk it in a well chamber. And now we have a well chamber that we can keep in a calibration lab and calibrate all of the clinical well chambers like you would be using in a clinic. 
and that's how we calibrate chambers. So the, the standard for that source is air current restraint. Okay. Back to electronic brachytherapy dosimetry. So electronic brachytherapy dosimetry is involving the use of a miniature X-ray tube, not a radionuclide anymore. We treat diseases with this at very near distances and very high dose rates. So a former student of Wisconsin, Stephen Davis, I'm using some pictures from his thesis. You can see an example of one of these miniature X-ray tubes here. Just fantastic piece of engineering. I mean, you can see it sitting on someone's finger there. And, and essentially, it's a cathode on the right side of that uh, photograph and an anode on the left side. And the anode's made out of tungsten. And you apply 50 kilovolts. So 50 k is the max energy that you're going to get out of this. The electrons go down that tiny little accelerator tube and they hit the target and create and create the Brumschlung radiation. And so that can be put inside of a patient. You can treat a skin with it. Yeah, like I said, it's a fantastic piece of engineering. In fact, they actually glow blue whenever you uh, turn them on. I don't have that picture here, but it's very, uh, very beautiful to see it when it's turned on. Now, one of these X-ray tube manufacturers, the one I showed in the last slide and this one, the name of the company is called Zoft, and the model of their source is called the Accent. The Zoft Accent is their system that they use for electronic brachytherapy. A few, a few details of this system, it has a tungsten anode. Like I said, 50 kV is the max potential, generates a lot of heat, and so therefore they have to put it in a cooling jacket. This is a cutaway of a Monte Carlo simulation. Different colors represent different materials in here, and this sort of grayish, uh, little brownish material around the edge is the cooling catheter. So saline goes down the cooling catheter, circulates back through a little, basically like an aquarium pump, keeps it moving around, and and then this requires a separate KB generator. It sits inside of another system that you can wheel around your department, and one nice thing about this system is since the energies are low you, and if you treat something inside of a patient, something like a breast lesion, a lumpectomy cavity is a very common treatment for this. You can actually be in the room. It's really neat. And you can put, they sell a little lead. It's like a flexible lead shield. Sometimes you can have your own lead. You can put it on the patient. And so uh, it's an advantage over Radium 192 where you definitely can't be in the room. Another advantage is this source can be turned on and off. So when you leave the room and it's off, there's no radiation in there and no radioactive materials license. So that's a big bonus, right? A radioactive material license, it costs money each year to license each source. It costs a lot of physicists time and energy to keep that license updated. There has to be an RSO. Anyways, a lot of paperwork, things like that. So that's what, these are the selling points of an electronic brachytherapy system. So what, what do you use one of these for? I mentioned you could treat skin, which would be surface brachytherapy, but you can also put it inside of a patient. You could do interstitial, you can do intracavitary, intraluminary. All these are possible treatments. You can see a photograph here of the Zoff system on the left. This one is mobile, kind of wheels around your department. On the right, you can see there's a little x-ray tube uh, labeled uh, with a little red arrow there on the left side of that photograph. And then the cooling connectors where it pumps some saline through to cool it down. And then you can see a high voltage connector. So 50 kilovolts, that needs a, a fairly robust connector to connect to the generator there. These are disposable sources. You can use them for um, a, a patient a finite amount of time. The manufacturer has recommendations on how many patients and uses, but they will, uh, they're not meant to be permanent sources. And that's a little different than some of the other systems. So moving on to one of the other systems, this is called the IntraBeam. This is from a company named Zeiss Medical, and they are out of Germany, I believe. And this system is a little bigger, right? So you can see on the left, it doesn't necessarily roll around quite as easily, but you can move it around departments. And it's primarily meant for doing intraoperative radiation therapy. If you've never heard of that, that is something that is not so common and bigger, but some centers do this still. And, and the idea is you can bring this device into the operating room. And if you do surgery, uh, like I said, a very common, common surgery for this would be a lumpectomy where you... Um, where you remove a breast cancer tumor, and then you can insert the end of this device into that cavity, turn it on for a couple minutes, irradiate where that lesion was, and that will prevent the recurrence there. So that's delivering dose at a very short distance away from there. You can see theirs is actually a little slightly different engineering. They've got an x-ray tube on the left with a filament. They've got some uh, accelerator rings there. And then those electrons actually drift down a 10 centimeter long drift tube, they call it. 
And then they slam into a gold target, which is on a beryllium thermal buffer. The model name for this is the XRS4. I think that's the source name. They have a couple different generations of this, but they all look pretty similar. And, and they don't have a cooling catheter. And so they have a different way to manage the heat. And so this is a uh, different, it's similar in that the energy is the same though. So once you have these two systems, there's different applicators. So on the left, you can see the Zeiss intrabeam spherical applicators that go inside of a lumpectomy cavity, cavity in the operating room. On the right, you can see some of the Zoft applicators. You can see similar saline balloon ac applicators on the top. Those balloons can be inflated and deflated. And then on the bottom, you can see some cervical applicators made out of titanium or, or maybe steel. And so those are for gynecological treatments. And I'm going to talk a little more about how that affects the dosimetry in a minute. All right, so the dosimetry of X-ray tubes. We talked about the dosimetry of iridium-192. Now, X-ray tubes are going to be different. Spectra tend to be a little more challenging dosimetrically than radionuclide sources. Radionuclide sources are going to have the same energy lines coming out of each, the same gamma rays coming out of each source, right? You might have different strengths of sources, but they're the same. But X-ray tubes, uh, they're a little more challenging because they could be a little different every day, a little bit different. And the standards for X-ray tubes are based on air kerma and not necessarily air kerma strength, like we talked about for iridium. So I've shown a photograph here on the bottom left with a little yellow arrow pointing to two things here. The one on the left is a big box. That box is actually a free air chamber, and this is in the laboratory at NIST. So NIST standardizes their X-ray beams by measuring the air kerma with a free air chamber. If you don't know what one of those is, you'll want to go look in a textbook by Frank Herb Addicts, probably, and get an idea of what those are for your certifications. On the right, uh, that's actually a known volume graphite spherical ionization chamber. That kind of thing only exists in standards labs as well. And that's for measuring the air kerma for slightly higher energies. But for a low energy X-ray beam, I've shown two spectra here for something like 100 kV and 80 kV. But you can see those are too low energy to have, uh, to penetrate the wall of a, a spherical chamber. So that's why they use a free air chamber. NIST has a lot of different X-ray beams that they standardize. And this list, I just copied it off the NIST website last week. These are different X-ray beam qualities. You don't need to look at all these, but there's a list of L beams, M beams, H beams. And what do those indicators mean? Like L50, L, uh, M200, and H150, you can see that's low filtration, medium filtration, and high filtration. A lot of, a most common one in the clinic is going to be an M series beam, like an M80, M200, M250 type of thing. That's mostly what we have at the ADCL. But if you want, there's all sorts of other beams. And a little spoiler alert here, there aren't any electronic breakage therapy beams. So that is how this, that is why this is a challenging dosimetry for electronic breakage therapy. Here is a calculation, actually it's three different calculations shown on the same graph with different Monte Carlo codes of the energy spectrum of an electronic breaking therapy source. This particular one is a soft accent. Just for example, the intrabeam source looks very similar to this. And this is in vacuum. So this is no attenuation in air, no attenuation in water and tissue or anything like that. So you can see it looks different than the X-ray beam spectrum I showed you a minute ago. This one's a little lower energy. And the filtration is going to be different, right? You're going to come out through a water cooling catheter, whereas the other beams are going to be filtered with aluminum and copper, maybe, maybe some different materials like a thorius filter. And, and x-ray beams are filtered for different reasons. Some of them are filtered to treat patients where you can keep a lot of the beam there, but harden the beam so it gets through the tissue better. Some of them are filtered for diagnostic purposes. And this one is, an, is a filter for a completely different purpose, for brachytherapy. So now we don't have a protocol. Well, we do have some other protocols in WAPM for reference dosimetry that are, that are similar and appropriate to some degree, but neither one of them is a perfect fit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through these two protocols. Uh, again, this is good studying for any board exam. You're going to have to try to memorize all these protocols. So I'm just going to refresh your memory. Probably a lot of you know TG43 by this point, and hopefully TG61 is familiar, but we'll go through them again here just briefly, just I think a slide on each one. Okay, 
TG43, that's for brachytherapy. That's for radionuclides. Iridium-192, like I just told you about, is included here. Also, other ones that you use for permanent prostate implants, permanent seed implants, like iodine-125, palladium-103. And these, this protocol is based entirely on Erkerma string, which is S sub K. So you can see the formula there, dose rate to the tissue at a distance at an angle away from the source is dependent on the Erkerma strength times the dose rate constant. That's the lambda. And then a whole bunch of scaling factors, Gs and Fs there. We aren't going to talk about those Gs and Fs. Those scale the dose to different locations. But I really want to talk today about Erkerma strength, which you can see below is defined as the Kerma rate at a distance of a meter basically times distance squared. And, and then the dose rate constant is the dose rate in water divided by air kerma strength. So these two allow you to get from your well chamber measurement to a dose rate to water. That's basically the, everything on this protocol is built around that. So you gotta know how to do a well chamber calibration. You gotta get your well chamber calibrated from an ADCL and then you can get dose to water. That's how all the planning systems work uh, for prostate implants, although they're moving more towards Monte Carlo now. But this is the basic TG43 protocol. Now, TG61, all right, I'm moving to a completely different protocol. This one was really for orthovoltage beams. And you can see it's set up for X-ray beams between 40 and 300 kV. And these X-ray beams generally are used to treat um, skin lesions, shallow lesions in a clinic. Someone who doesn't have an electron uh, LINAC or hasn't commissioned their electron beams or something will use uh, an x-ray beam. And this protocol also gives you dose to water. You can see the equation there on the left side is dose. This one gives you dose at 2 cm deep at one particular point, whereas the last protocol gave you dose at one centimeter, but they're, that's pretty much the same thing. And it's based on the reading in an ion chamber, not a well chamber, times the calibration on air kerma calibration on that ion chamber, times some other corrections to get from water or to get from air to water. And so that's M times NK. Now NK is an X-ray beam calibration, but it's based on those NIST beams and not EBT. So this one's close as well because it's dealing with X-ray beams, but really no cigar and a little bit more on why this is not gonna work perfectly. Um, just a note here on these EBT sources. So. These are pretty low energies, 50 kV is pretty low. And they're attenuated as the beam goes through tissues and they're attenuated. So that makes for a hard measurement, right? Cause you put a detector in very close to a source. It's hard to know what the energy spectrum is. And so it's hard to deal with the calibration of that chamber. You also have issues with measuring in air, but not quite as many because the beam doesn't harden quite as much in air, but you still have to deal with air attenuation quite a bit. So we've made it to our first polling question, and I'll read it out loud here. What is the source strength metric for standard iridium-192 ACR brachytherapy? Is it air kerma, K, air kerma strength, activity in curies, or dose to water, D? And I'll give you guys a little bit of time to answer this. Okay, great. Thank you so much for putting this question up. We have it in the poll section for you all to weigh in on. And I also want to encourage anyone who might have a question for Dr. Culberson to please be sure to ask it in the chat section so that we can go over those at the end of the presentation here. Um, all right, let's see. Let's just give everyone another moment to weigh in. Either everyone's getting the correct answer um, or some folks aren't putting in their answers yet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay, let's see. We have a little bit of variation now on our answers. Okay, great. Okay, uh, do you wanna end the poll or do you want me to end the poll here? Yeah, let's go ahead and review the answer. Okay, the answer, the correct answer, let me go back to my slides, is B, your Kerma strength. So you guys did a great job. Everybody's awake, paying attention. And hopefully the questions get a little more challenging for you guys. <laughs> Great, no, good job. And already my two standards, definitely air Kerma strength. Measure with that seven distance. Okay, moving on here. The problem, okay, now we've got, I've, I've, I've noted a couple of issues here. Well, there's some bigger issues too. The two manufacturers that, that I've mentioned so far in this talk, they've chosen different roads, air Kerma, air comma strength or dose to water measurements. And 
AAPM has no consensus recommendations yet. So when I when I went to the brachytherapy subcommittee meeting a few years ago, and and I have some interest in electronic brachytherapy, I, I raised my hand and volunteered to start a task group, and <laughs> I had no idea what I had volunteered for. <laughs> so I, I get to tell you now about this task group and how we're trying to approach this problem. The, the task group was formed uh, five years ago. Doesn't seem like that long. And you can see February 2015, I really proposed it. It was approved in November 2016. And yes, that is about a year and a half later. It takes a long time to get one of these approved. Went through many, many drafts. And the sunset date, which means when we have to be done with a reviewable draft, is this coming December, unless it's extended due to COVID. <laughs> so we're coming down what we hope is a home stretch. We still have a lot of work to do. But that's our task group timeline. Here are the lovely faces of all of my lovely task group members. I'm the chair, but I have a vice chair who's a lot of help. Mark Rivardi has a lot of experience in brachytherapy dosimetry. We have 10 members. They have various experiences, some more Monte Carlo, some clinical, some work at university hospitals, and some don't. The official charge, I'm not going to read all this, a lot of words on one slide, but basically our task group is about just the interstitial, intracafeteria, intraluminary applications of EBT. We're going to basically review the approaches. And what does that mean? We're going to go look at what the vendors are suggesting that clinics do. Because clinics are using this. You can use a source, even if it doesn't have WAPM task group written about it. You just have to follow their recommendations. And so we're going to hopefully form recommendations based on some sort of modified task group formalism, task group 43 and or task group 61. We need to have NIST traceability. We have to have the right methods to measure these things. We need descriptions of the effects of applicators. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And the inclusion of IROC AAPM, IROC Houston registry. Some discussion on that at least. What are we going to have to consider? Well, we have to consider the other task groups and make sure we don't step on their toes. We have to consider all the manufacturers equally. Right? We're not biased towards any of them. Some of our members uh, have each one of these devices in their departments. And we also have to do risk-based analysis. So that's after TG100 was published. Every task group has to have an FMEA or risk-based analysis. All right, these two systems, I'm showing them side by side, are being considered for our task group. There are some other systems, such as Nuclatron Estea, that's in the United States and FDA approved, but Nuclatron Estea is only for surface applications. So therefore, they're not going to be under the purview of our task group. The similarities between these systems, well, they both have the similar energies. That makes life a lot easier, so we can really compare them pretty well, 50 kV. They both are used for intraoperative radiation therapy in a variety of applicators, but their differences, they are cooled differently. Like I mentioned earlier, Zoft uses circulating coolant. The intrabeam has some steering challenges, right? They have that drift tube I showed you. It's 10 centimeters long. It's skinny, it's bendable, unfortunately. Well, fortunately and unfortunately. And you have to monitor the output of both of these systems in different ways. So Zoft uses a well-type chamber, ion chamber, and Intrabeam uses a parallel plate chamber. So very different. And they have a completely different set of routine QA tests. So what does the manufacturer recommend? I'm going to talk through these kind of slowly. And I'm, for the next several slides, we're going to be talking about um, this formula. And Zoft has gone through two phases of dosimetry recommendations, the top formula and the bottom formula. The top formula looks, that's the TG43 formula. That's what they recommended to get started. But I'm not going to actually talk about too much because they've moved away from that. And now for the last several years, they've been recommending the bottom formula, which is very similar looking to TG43 at the top formula. But it's the first two uh, quantities are different. The first two variables there are different. So instead of air kerma strength, the Zoff source is standardized by air kerma rate at 50 centimeters in air. Okay. Um, and then the second, instead of having dose rate constant in terms of lambda, it's called the dose conversion coefficient, chi. Okay. But they do very similar things. Chi converts air kerma rate to dose to water just like lambda converts air kerma strength to dose to water. So we're going we're gonna to dive a little deeper into those two, but that's the basics of what they're recommending right now. Now, Zeiss has a very different formalism that they recommend. Uh, still dose on the left, dose rate, but on the right, instead of measuring kerma rate in air, they've got NK, which is a 
a parallel plate chamber calibration coefficient times Q, which is the charge reading of that parallel pl plate coefficient, or charge reading, sorry. And then once you get Kerma rate, this parallel plate chamber is actually in a tank of water. And you're measure you use this KQ and K K A to dose the water on the right side of that equation to convert your air kerma in the water tank. Yes, I'm saying that air kerma is measured in the water tank, and you got to convert it to water, dose to water. So that's what this formula is about. This is essentially the TG61 approach, very similar. Okay. Now these current approaches, they both use air kerma in their formalisms, but very different methods of determining the absorbed dose rate to water, which is what you need for each one of these. So the in general terms, that Zoft approach, and I just kind of talked about this, they use air kerma rate of 50 centimeters in air and convert it to dose to water at one centimeter. And then from that location, right, that gives you the dose rate at one point at one centimeter away from the source. Then you use all those Gs, G sub Ls, uh, times that's anisotropy, radial dose function, that will then essentially scale that dose to all the other depths. That's similar to the TG43 approach. Same nomenclature, actually. The entropy approach, you don't see any Gs, you don't see any Fs or radial dose functions or anything like that. There's, theirs is the air kerma calibration of a parallel plate chamber. And their traceability is to NIST as well, but a different route. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. The calibration coefficients are, are correct for the presumed source X-ray spectrum. So that is very important because, remember, I talked about earlier that EBT spectrum is not the same as the NIST spectra that exists right now. So there's some assumptions that have to be made here or some interpolations. Okay, that's very important. It's not a straight shot to NIST. There's an interpolation step there. And the, and the manufacturer will provide these conversions on the right side, the KQ and the K sub KA to dose to water. Those are provided by the manufacturer. Okay, polling question two. And we're gonna kick off the poll here and I'm gonna start reading it. The Zoft Accent EBT system output is based on air kerma rate at a distance of one centimeter in water, one centimeter in air, 50 centimeters in air or one meter in air? Okay, great. This question is up and running in our poll section. Be sure to go ahead and answer this while you can live. And also um, just a reminder, if you have any questions to post them up in the chat so that we can go over them in the Q&A at the end here, or we'll just give everyone just another moment to answer this question. It looks like it was a little trickier than the last one. Yeah, I said, hopefully these get a little harder. <laughs> All right, why don't we go ahead and review the answer here. Okay, so the correct answer is 50 centimeters in air, okay? So that was that air kerma rate with a little subscript of 50 centimeters. And a couple people, it looks like we had a couple of answers for one centimeter in water. Yeah, that's that's a little bit of a, um, a tricky one because that's where you finally end up is going to be the dose rate to one centimeter in air. I'm sorry, in water, but the output is really based on the air kerma rate at a distance of 50 centimeters in air. Yeah, so good, good job everyone for answering there. We'll move on here. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that you can put these EBT sources in different applicators. So when you place an EBT source inside of something like a breast balloon applicator, those circular spherical applicators, you will get some change in dosimetry, but overall it's relatively small. They make these applicators so that they're filled with some sort of water equivalent material or some sort of plastic that's fairly low density, fairly low Z. And so the effects are around 10% or so, actually less sometimes. And the manufacturers provide corrections for those. Now, if an EBT source goes inside of a cervical applicator, so you can see on the right here, the, those are all cervical applicators. Now, those are metal and they're relatively thick. And this is a very low energy spectrum so when they start going through that metal, they get severely attenuated. So it drops the output of the source by a factor of seven. So this is way different than iridium-192 brachytherapy where these applicators just barely drop the activity or the dose rate of these sources. In fact, sometimes you know people don't even really apply corrections for it. But for EBT, a factor of seven, this is huge. Okay, so this is very important part of EBT dosimetry. Each applicator will have to be have its own set of corrections and coefficients. In addition to the applicator, this shows 
uh, Monte Carlo simulation by Samantha Simile. She was a former graduate of UW. She did her PhD on the Zoft accent source inside of these cervical applicators. And she was doing some Monte Carlo models. This was a cutaway of her models here showing different amounts of pullback. So if you've ever been a part of a brachytherapy program, you know you step these sources back through their applicators. So if you were to step a Zoft source, an EBT source back through its applicator, each one of those positions has a different set of dosimetry parameters. So that changes the dosimetry. How much? Well, not a whole lot, but enough that you need to take it into account. So this, this is one more challenge. Okay, now that's the clinical applicators. So Zoft, I mentioned, was based on the air crimmer rate of 50 centimeters, but since nobody in a clinic is gonna be able to actually measure that, the user is gonna use a well chamber. So every day before treatment, a Zoft user is going to put their source inside of a well chamber. And if you've ever used a well chamber, you probably do not recognize this insert that's on top. It's metal and it holds the source in place up in the air vertically. And then it positions the source down inside the chamber. Um, it's very it's a very nice rigid holder. It works very well. And so every day you're gonna be able to verify the output of your source by using this well chamber. And you also will be able to apply a calibration from the ADCLs for this well chamber. Now for Zoft accent, I'm sorry, for the Zeiss intrabeam system, going back and forth a little bit here, day-to-day, uh, -day, you don't use a well chamber. In fact, they don't include a well chamber of the system. They, You have the option to buy this water tank, and I think most users do. And in this water tank, you can put a parallel plate chamber, measure the dose rate in water with that formalism I showed you earlier. So this is a very different way to measure the output of these sources. So the Zoff source is looking at an air chroma strength calibration on a well chamber, and this one, the intrabeam, is looking at dose rate in water from a parallel plate chamber. Very specialized water tank, but it does a very nice job of holding these sources in chambers because that chamber is really close. It has to be positioned very accurately. Traceable quantity. So you've got both of those readings in those well chambers and ion chambers. They're traceable to NIST through two different pathways. The Zoft is through chroma rate of 50. The intrabeam is through the air chroma calibration on a parallel plate chamber. And I think I, I think the next slide is going to show you. This is an actual uh, fuzzy photograph on the left um, that I took at NIST in their laboratory for measuring electronic brachytherapy, the Zoft accent source. So in the middle of this photo, I've got a, a few labels here that shows where the source is placed. On the left side is a free air chamber. It's a very small free air chamber. And you can see a, on a zoomed in photograph on the right. It's called the Lamperty free air chamber. It's named after Paul Lamperty, who was a scientist at NIST. A while ago, he invented this chamber or designed this chamber for other X-ray energies, but it happens to work very well for Zoff being 50 kV and lower. And you can see a cutaway of it there. Um, you can read about how these work in your textbooks, but basically there's no there's no wall. So that's very nice for low energy X-rays. On the right side of the photograph, on the left side, you can see a spectrometer and the spectrometer is used each time a source comes into the national lab, they'll measure the spectrum and make sure that it matches previous sources because if this spectrum looks different, then we're, we're not going to want to create a standard on different energies each time. So they usually do a few sources of these at a time, and then they take these sources and send them around to the calibration lab. So now that we have direct traceability to the Zoff source, for Zeiss, it's a different approach. It's going to be a standard X-ray beam, and there's no intrabeam system at NIST. So basically, I've shown a few different X-ray beams the top two are from a German uh, calibration lab called PTW. The second, the third and fourth one here are from the lab I work in, the UW ADCL. And then you can see their half value layers on the right. The last one is the intrabeam. And you can see that the half value layer is sort of the best indicator of beam energy. And you can see that it's right in between basically two energies at UW, 40 and 50. So whoever is using this is gonna need to get two calibrations and interpolate based on half value layer. On the right, you can see the different spectra of the standard beams, the T-series beams, which are very similar to our L-series beams. And at the top, you can see the EBT source. So they're different, right? They may have, that's why the half value layers don't match. Okay, polling question three. The intrabeam users make the following measurements to determine the source strength. Are they gonna have an ion chamber measurement in air? They're gonna have an ion chamber measurement in water, a free air chamber, or intrabeam users are not able to verify the source strength. 
All right, great. So some folks are already on this one, answering it in the poll section. So be sure to put in your answer since it'll just be up for a minute. And um, yep, after this presentation, we'll go ahead and answer your questions in the chat for the Q&A. So be sure to uh, put your questions there for Dr. Culberson. And we'll give everyone just another moment to answer this poll question before we review the answer. Looks like we're getting some varied answers here. All right, why don't we go ahead and go over the correct response. Okay, the correct answer, most of you got this right, great job, is the ion chamber measurement in water. So that intrabeam system, remember you can buy a water tank, you put an ion chamber measurement, a, a parallel plate chamber there, and that's how you basically get the strength of this source for the day or for the week, for the month, however often, however often you need to do that measurement. The free air chamber was used for the Zoff source, okay, and that's at NIST. Great, good job. Most everybody got that. Okay, other QA tests. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but every time you treat with one of these systems, you have to do some other tests. On the right here, you can see what the intrabeam system needs is you have to align that drift tube. Like I mentioned, it can get bent a little, so you got to make sure it's straight for the day. And there's little internal radiation monitors, they're diodes, to sort of check the output each day. So that's kind of how they do what Zoft is doing with a well chamber. They're going to measure the output with a diode. And there's a host of QA tasks that are recommended for each system. Basically, the manufacturer provides a list of what you're supposed to do. So the challenges facing our task group is to, first of all, develop a complete understanding of the formalisms from the manufacturers to deal with the fact there's new source models that seem to come out and, then need, and the fact there's new publications that have come out in the last five years since we started our task group. I'm going to show you a little zoom in of one of our challenges. Three Monte Carlo models showing the Zoft accent source over the last seven years, seeing how there's differences. They keep adding little things in there, or we keep tweaking our models to match their system. Um, so that's a challenge if the dosimetry parameters change with time. The intrabeam trial. Now, this, this sort of falls under the category of us trying to figure out what's going on currently with these systems. There, this is a well-timed webinar because just yesterday, the long-term results of a clinical trial for intraoperative radiation therapy were published. And so I'm going to show you a few highlights of this and why this is important to this webinar today. The Target A trial, it was started a long time ago, right? What is that? Um, over 20 years ago, treated over 2,000 patients for intraoperative radiation therapy for breasts. Okay, and comparing IORT with external beam radiation therapy. So. This is just a quick summary. If you're interested, I've given you the link. Um, again, this was published yesterday in, in, in uh, I think it's British Medical Journal, BMJ. And when, okay, so a few knowns that they highlighted in the study. When early breast cancer is treated with lumpectomy, getting whole breast reduces the risk of local recurrence. This is known from a long time ago. And they also know that if you restrict the dose to the areas surrounding the target, you're going to have the benefits of immediacy and avoid the delays in post-operative radiation therapy. Meaning if you could treat right at the time of the surgery, you get everything done. It's nicer for the patient. Uh, the early results from this IORT trial indicate this approach has many advantages, like for traveling, improved quality of life, fewer side effects. Uh, that's what was known before they kind of got this trial started. Now, what did they find? Well, there's two main things. First of all, they looked at a lot of patients hundreds of patients, thousands of patients, the result of this trial show that target IORT has similar long-term local control, meaning you control that cancer and the survival outcomes are very similar. This is just showing one of the overall survival graphs, comparing the um, sort of EBT approach or the IORT approach to external beam, showing very similar here. The survival curves are similar. They also show mortality was actually lower um, overall and about the same for breast cancer. So it was lower from other causes. Now, you'd have to read the details of this, but basically that's a good thing, right, for the target trial to show there's an improvement there. So showing some positive re results, but when we started looking at this trial, we saw some, the, the, the manufacturers providing two sets of dose rate tables. So we needed to identify this and publish something very rapidly. So we uh, published an article just last month that considers these two different dose rate tables that are provided to the users. And the purpose of this report is really to clarify, there's two dose rate tables. One's called the target doses and the other one's called the version 4.0 doses. And it's kind of confusing. And the differences are up to 30%. So depending on what applicator and what depth. So this was very important to us. So I'm gonna real quick show you version 4.0 doses are basically 
the formula I showed you earlier, which is based on a parallel plate chamber times a reading. And here's all the, the coefficients in this, or all the variables in this equation. I'm not going to go through them, but I basically have talked about them. And the dose rate in these tables represents physical dose fairly closely. Then the target dose rates were basically what they uh, settled on like 20 years ago, and they just stuck with it. They were done with an ion chamber that wasn't the best, and the readings were converted based on an F factor, right? That's like straight out of our, our old textbooks of 0.881 for monoenergetic photons. And so this just dosimetry wasn't as good. And there were several problems with this. And what we showed is that for the different, this is a table in this publication of mine from last month, the applicators on the left showing the differences on the right. You can see the biggest one's 30%. Generally they're 10 to 30% different. That's a big deal, okay? And that people just need to get squared away in their departments, which set of dose rates they're gonna use and why they're using them and just be entirely clear on the basis of those. There are benefits, of course, sometimes to keeping clinical trial dose rates the same, right? That, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm, so I'm not going to say that these, this is wrong, but they aren't representing physical dose rates. And it's going to be really hard to verify that as a, as a physicist if you're using some target dose rates. So this has been debated. It's, it was just basically felt very important by our task group that we need to get this information out. So that's what this publication is about. Okay. Polling question four. Now, you have to go back several slides in your mind. Uh, this is the last polling question. The NIST standard for the Zoft accent electronic brachytherapy source is A, the Lamperti free air chamber, B, the Addicts free air chamber, C, a calorimeter, or D, a graphite ionization chamber. All right, great. As Dr. Coverson mentioned, this is the last polling question, so be sure to answer live while you can. And also um, feel free to drop any questions you might have in the chat for the Q&A coming up here soon. And we'll just give everyone another moment to answer this question. Um, and then we'll go ahead and review the answer. All right, it looks like folks are definitely engaged here with this question. Why don't we go ahead and- Okay, let me move. The correct answer is the Lamperti for your chamber. It looks like most everybody answered that, but there was several answers for the addicts for your chamber. And, and that's great because addicts for your chamber is probably the most common one covered in textbooks. It's, uh, it's for mammography energies. It's slightly, it's very similar to Lamperti, but it's used for, uh, for slightly different purposes for mammography x-ray beams. And, and it wasn't the one chosen by this for this, uh, for this project with Zoft. So yeah, for Zoft, it's the Lamperti for your chamber. And then a calorimeter, definitely not. The energy is too low. And that graphite ion chamber can't be used either because it's got too thick of a wall. Okay, moving on, what's the status of a task group report? Well, like I said, we're supposed to be finished by this year. We've assigned writing uh, for all the members. We're gathering more information on the current approaches. We're working with both the manufacturers. So although we have some concerns about some of those formalisms, like I've mentioned today, we, we have representatives from both manufacturers that we stay in constant contact with, and they are reviewing, uh, we'll be reviewing our task group report. So we're all on the same page. It's better to work with them than against them. The recommendations, uh, well, I can't list them because they're not finalized, but uh, you've seen some of the formalisms I've shown. They're gonna be similar to those. The goal is to be sensitive to what's going on currently, but also make sure there's clear recommendations for clinical users and researchers moving forward from us as an unbiased group of, of volunteers. I, I would also mention all the people that task groups at the WPM, we're just volunteering our time. We're just trying to do something good. And so it, that's why it takes a while to put all this together. We're also going to consider the source registry so people can just go online and find that information. The sunset date for our task group is the end of this year. Again, we might get an extension. Uh, if anyone has any questions about this task group, you know, if you feel free to email me uh, or anyone else on the task group. We're, we're just uh, all in this together. And I want to give a few acknowledgments. This brings me to the end of the presentation on my part before we answer some questions. The TG292 members have been very helpful. Everyone I showed in that earlier slide, the, the Tom Raj, Linda Kelly from Zoft, and Frank Wigan from Zeiss, they've all been very helpful answering our questions and providing uh, even some of the data in these slides. So again, I think this brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you all for participating. Everybody did well in the polling questions. Uh, so I think, I think it's time to look at some chat questions. All right, our first question here is, 
Have you found that the dosimetry, absolute output, and energy spectrum to be very consistent between, um, I think, I mean, so soft. Soft, 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 and soft. Yeah, it's pronounced soft. Kind of spelled X soft, right? But it's pronounced soft. Good question. So the only reason I know the answer to this is because I work in a lab where there's been research projects on this. This is something that, yeah, a clinical user would really not be able to tell. And, and NIST also knows this too. So the answer is yes. We found that the energy spectrum, okay, this is two questions, the absolute output and the energy spectrum. The energy spectrum are actually very similar from source to source. So that's a really good thing. Um, slight variations, but nothing that requires changing dosimetry parameters. Now the output, that is very different source to source. It's something very easy to measure for each source. That's why you have a well chamber, but the output can vary. You know, they have a nominal output that they specify. And I think it can be different up to, oh, I think 10 or 20% from source to source. And that makes sense, right? Each one's going to have a slightly different set of uh, a layer of tungsten coating on the anode and slightly different thicknesses of plastic in that water cooling catheter. So yeah. And, and actually the output these days is higher than it used to be. They've made a couple of small changes and, and I think they actually paint on a little more tungsten these days. So the output's a little higher, but uh, yeah, that's similar, but it, I wouldn't assume it's the same from source to source, that's for sure. Okay. All right, thanks for answering that question. Our next question here, are plans with these machines comparable to HDR? The, uh, the plans comparable to HDR, you know, they're similar. Comparable uh, is sort of a broad term. HDR, the biggest difference is the energy, right? The energy of HDR is about 400 kV. So that dose cloud around an iridium source is going to be much larger. It's just going to penetrate a lot further in tissue. And sometimes that's a good thing. Um, but for sometimes people don't want it to penetrate that far. So it can be sometimes more advantageous to use an electronic brachytherapy source. So no, uh, they're not. I'd say uh, for lumpectomy, like post-surgery plan, they look very good. They're very favorable because you don't get as much skin dose. But for something gynecological, putting a low energy source in there is harder to get that dose cloud out to the distances you need to treat the full cervical cuff or uh, the vaginal area. So yeah, they have some pros and cons. The plans are not that similar. However, there's users that make it work, right? They, I mean, there's people that use it for that. So it's just a matter of uh, working within the confines that you have, the constraints that you have. Thank you for answering that question. Um, this looks like our last question here. Do you also consider other EBT sources such as Estes? Um, Estea. Estea, Estea yeah. Also, yes. Uh, and Ralph Behrens, yeah, hey, uh, familiar uh, name there. I think uh, over in Germany, actually. So we do consider Nucleotron Estea. I had that on an earlier slide as, as far as I'm aware, they're just using it for the skin treatments. I don't believe they have applicators that are intended to go inside the patient. And if they do, I'm not aware of them. And we, of course, would need to consider them. Like I said, they uh, we've tried to consider all FDA approved manufacturers in the US. There's some around the world that uh, don't have approval. And the Nucleotron Estea is FDA approved in the US, but I thought it was just for for surface breaking therapy for skin lesions. So hopefully that answers your question there. Okay, thank you for answering that one. We had another one pop in here last minute. Will TG292 deal with 3D dose distribution around the EBT sources? I would say yes, we will deal with it, but it's not the job of a task group to create any new scientific data. So we're not going to be able to measure the distributions ourselves. What we would do is try to come up with consensus consensus data or at least consensus on what publications to use for those dose distributions around the source. Now, the manufacturers provide dose rate tables. So that essentially gives you your PDDs. The, there are publications for Zoth that give you the, the anisotropy data and the and the depth dose and the radial dose. But yeah, yeah, that's our goal is to be able to point people in the right direction. Like TG43 tries to provide consensus data. So you'll you'll find two publications out there. One is a measurement, one is a calculation, and you can average them at the, you know, in the level of a task group and then provide consensus data. That would be our goal. I mean, that would be what we'd really like to do. Now, at this moment, there is no measurement publication for the Zoft. Uh, accent. So we're kind of waiting on that. Hopefully it'll come out by the end of the year. We can provide some recommendations, but yep, that's our goal. All right. Great. Thank you so much for this presentation and answering all those questions. And thank you all for joining us for this 
free event hosted by WePass. I just want to remind everyone that this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel for the next seven days. So if you need to review this presentation, be sure to check it out there. And also keep in mind that this and many other webinars are always available to WePass subscribers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So register through WePass.com to become a subscriber. And for up-to-date information about upcoming webinars, be sure to follow WePass on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you have a moment, um, help us improve future webinars by taking this short survey. Thanks again. Have a good day.